honoring our Heavenly Father. Amen. Greetings, church, family. Today we're going to celebrate Father's Day and to give honor to whom honor is due. It's plain to see that the enemies work very hard in destroying the family. Yet the family is an ideal model to raise people up. You find a good example of it in Colossians and Ephesians, how the, the husband is to love the wife and the wife to respect her husband. Notice it says the, the husband is to love his wife and the wife is to show respect to her husband. It didn't say to love her husband first. It says to respect her husband first. Woo! And that's what happens. You can say, oh, I love you, dear, but show no respect and you'll destroy your marriage. Respect is one of the qualities God gives us to show others to give honor. Can you say amen? Even when Jesus was confronted about his taxes, he says, what do you see on the coin? Well, we see... Uh, uh, Caesar, so render unto Caesar what's Caesar's, and render unto God what's God's. Say amen. All right, so as we continue on, this is Father's Day. We want to honor our Heavenly Father by receiving his word. Jesus said, if I be lifted up, right? All right, how about the Bible? The Bible, is it Jesus? Yes. So when you read the word, you're lifting who up? Yeah, so everything is a center point of Christ Jesus. All the things in the Old Testament, the Sabbath, the temple, the elements of the temple, the feasts, all point to Jesus. Now that's Old Testament. And people that follow the Old Testament so much, they're still looking for Jesus to come. And I'll tell you, they don't know if the rapture is going to be pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib, or whatever trib. Because they are literally confused because they haven't got their covenants down. They haven't realized that we're in the new covenant and much better promises, much better equipment, supernaturally run by Jesus Christ, who now dwells in you and I. We're not just natural believers believing God and holding on till he comes. If you're walking that way, you're going to wear out. Some people call it burnout. Why am I burning out? Because you are working too hard to be something God already made you. Now, yield, listen, obey, and you will grow up into him who's the head of all principality and power. Say amen, somebody. Let's look at our scripture. All right, this is Luke 11, 1 through 4. Now it came to pass as he was praying. What was Jesus doing? Praying. Folks, if you don't pray every day, are you better than Jesus? Be thinking about that. If he had to pray, and he was Christ. Now it came to pass as he was praying in a certain place. When he ceased, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to what? as John taught his disciples. So listen, remember what testament here in. They're in the Old Testament right now. Jesus hadn't died. Jesus hadn't risen again. So there's no invoking the name of Jesus yet. So he said to them, when you pray, what's the next word? It didn't say think. It says when you pray, use your lips. And it comes from your heart. Folks, there's a lot of people, now listen, I'm going to just talk to you, this is Father's Day. A lot of people pray off the top of their head, not in their head. They pray off the top, and you hear them talking, oh Lord, thank you, and it's just surface. Some people preach that way. You want to hear preaching like that? Go to the, the uh, ceremonial Old Testament churches. They preach and talk just like the Jews did, and the Jews miss God. Didn't they? What did they do with Jesus? They lovingly accept him? They killed him. Because Jesus, now listen, didn't fit religion. How many know Jesus never fits religion? So don't be religious. Say amen. We won't meddle too long there. Let's go on. When you pray, say, our Father, who do we address? Who's above all, through all, in and all? Our Father, come on, our Father in heaven. Now, in the New Testament, we would go, our Father in heaven, in Jesus' name. 
hallowed be your name. Folks, if you can't remember Yahweh, or if you can't remember I am, those are the other names of God, remember the name of Jesus. For there's no other name given among men whereby you must be saved. There's no other higher name than could be named other than the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. So when you say, Father, in Jesus' name, all of the covenant, all of heaven stands, and you just get whisked up into the presence of God before the Father. You know, I, I kind of laugh at these people. I call them the Daniel prayers. Oh, like Daniel, we're waiting for the answer to our prayer. Folks, when you say Father in Jesus' name, the answer is already stamped on you. It's just on its way. Amen. Now, don't do anything to shut that down by talking against it. The name of Jesus is the glorified stamp that shoves everything through heaven and shoves everything back. It is escorted by the angelic host of God. And by the way, Satan only has one third and God has two thirds in this planet. We are much more powerful than he is. The problem is we're too poisoned by negativity. I wonder what God's going to do. He's always going to do good for you. Say amen. I'm meddling with you a little bit, fathers. How do you love your children? Think about the father, how he loves his children. I'm going to have a little cereal here this morning. <laughs> Woo. All right. Now, continue on. Look what it says. So he says, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, holy be your name, your kingdom come. You will be done on earth as it is in heaven. How is it in heaven, by the way? Any sick people there? Any poor people there? How about selfish people who always run outside when it's time for the offering? Hello? And three, give daily bread. Supply our need. Forgive everyone who's indebted to us. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the what? And then when you finish a prayer like that, you pray and finish it in the name of? Jesus. That's right. We're New Testament. New Testament. But even in the Old Testament, Jesus says, you go first to who? The Father. And, and why? We have to present ourselves. If we don't present ourselves and we go to the Father in the flesh, first thing he has to do is cleanse us so he can recognize us. <laughs> hey, you see all this dirt and sin on my life? Lord, I come to you in Jesus' name. <laughs> oh, it's you, Carrie. What are you doing out there in the playground of the world, acting like the world and playing with the world? Don't you know it's going to kill you? Moving right along. Father's Day. All right, would you take your Bibles, and we're going to go back to uh, Hebrews, uh, excuse me, Luke chapter 11 again. All right, I want you to go back to Hebrews, uh, excuse me, I don't know why I say Hebrews. Luke chapter 11, 1 through 4. Now, I want to tell you something. My dad was a very, very, very worldly wise man. <laughs> He was a very good man. Now, some of you that met him, you all know that he's a good man. He's not a perfect man. I used to come to him, and every time I would come to him, because he knew me, I'd come to him and I says, Dad, I love you. And he says, what do you want now? I said, Dad, how do you know? <laughs> and I began to think about that. And I said, why do I come to my father always because I have need? And I want to tell you, God wants you to come to him all the time with your need. Please don't take read extra into what I'm telling you. But one day I thought, you know, I'm going to come to my dad, and I'm, I'm just going to tell my dad, I don't need anything, dad. I just want to tell you I love you and I respect you. And man, 
in. It seemed like every door opened up. My dad cooked me my special steak. My mom was nicer to me. And I'm going, wow, a world of change. Because I went to my father to acknowledge him and to show love and respect to him. Folks, here's, where, here's what the devil does. People that are coming out of drugs and alcohol and party life, and they're trying to come to church, Satan immediately tries to turn one against the other. Oh, because you do this and you do that. God doesn't want you in his holy church. You see how he builds the opposition? Listen, I'd rather have somebody come to church drunk and hear the word and get saved than to stay at home feeling sorry for self. Do you hear me? We have lost the idea what salvation in the church is about. It's a hospital for the sick. Don't act so sanctified. You see. So you get somebody who's, who's that's all they know is partying. Their kid, so their friends call them up on a Saturday night. They're supposed to watch their Saturday night because the devil will have every one of your friends you've never even seen before call you up. So you won't make church Sunday morning. Say, oh me, everybody. Protect your Saturday evenings. Now, what does the Jewish people call Saturday? The Sabbath. Now, come on. And God gave the Sabbath to them so they wouldn't kill their ennui cells. The Sabbath was made for man, not for God. God gave them the Sabbath so they wouldn't work themselves to death. She says, on the Sabbath, don't do anything. And so the Jewish people says, yeah, don't even touch an elephant. Did you know in, in Israel, on the Sabbath, on Saturday the Sabbath, they block off the buttons on the elevator that you can't even push them. They have a guy in there that pushes them for you that's a Gentile. I'm not joking with you because you don't know that. I've been to Israel. I'm going, what's this? Because on the Sabbath, they made the Sabbath gaudy. And then they may try to make everybody obey. Don't you dare lift any work on, on Sabbath. And Jesus said, he said this, which of you having a dog or a cat, I'm using modern language, or a sheep or a goal then fall in the ditch, you didn't get it out on the Sabbath, you hypocrites. Sabbath wasn't made for you not to do nothing. The Sabbath, was, now listen carefully, was made for the children of Israel to contemplate the next day. Next day. That who rose? So, announced to them, give them a Sabbath to prepare for a Sunday. <laughs> Plays gamey, gamey, gameys. Now, God said, keep the Sabbath holy, and I'm not belittling that. But the word holy, there, so you don't kill. Pastor Kerry's illustrations. It's the simple truth. Now, I'm not belittling anything. I'm just telling you what people will do when they're religious. They'll put a rule on you. And they'll say, you got to do it this way because we've done it this way for years. Do you understand me? And when Jesus didn't do it that way, they killed him. And Jesus said, I'm glad you did because it was a trap all along. If Satan would have been real smart, he would have never crucified Jesus. Everyone say, God is so smart and he lives in me. Yeah, let him reign. Let him think through you. Stop trying to analyze everything. It's okay to analyze, but not everything. All right, are you with me? Back to Luke chapter 11. Look at verse 1 again. Now it came to pass, as he was praying in a certain place, that he ceased, that one of his disciples came to him and said, Lord, teach us how to pray, as John taught his disciples. And then he went through the same that we read already. We're going to cover these four areas. Yes. Number one, daily present yourself before God. Daily present yourself before God. That means from the time of the pillow to the time of the bathroom, you have greeted God in Jesus' name. Everyone say this. Good morning, Heavenly Father. In Jesus' name. 
I don't care if you got the worst breath in your life. Good morning, Heavenly Father. And Jesus, the moment you do, the Spirit of God drops on you, and your day picks up before your feet hit the ground. This is what I'm saying about meeting with God first. Not sitting a whole hour wasting your time. You do that when you could do that. But if you don't greet God in the first of your day, your day is going to be iffy or icky. Come on, say, I got it. So when I look at you and I say, how was your prayer today? I'm talking about 10 quick minutes of presenting yourself before God so he can wholly sanctify you and get you ready for the day. That's all I'm saying. And if you look at me with a blank stare, I'm saying, you wonderful person, you've got your life in front of God. And you don't even greet God, and yet he gave you your life back. How, what a terrible insult to our Heavenly Father. Now, what are you going to do first thing in the morning? Try it. Greet him. Heavenly Father, I thank you. I have breath in my lungs. I can think. Thank you that you've given me a business, a family, loved ones. Now straighten me out, get me ready as I head to work. Some of us have a commute. And my commutes, man, what a prayer closet. I'll be shunned along, praying, whoa, going down the free. Take advantage of your time. You only have us so much. See, man. All right. So, you know, I'm not scalping at you, okay? Now, when we read the Lord's Prayer, like you heard me read twice, these are stations that you're to cover. First station, you are to greet the Father in Jesus' name. Second, you're to lift him up as holy. Hallowed be your name, which means holy, perfect, just, I'm so glad. Just lavish on him a little. Can you say amen? Your kingdom come. Now, let me talk about that. I'm getting hit on myself. The kingdom came at Pentecost, didn't it? Okay? I mean, in the atmosphere that we breathe, there's a kingdom of heaven dwelling. We're going to get back to this. But... God builds his kingdom in you, so they both work together by his word. So if you're never in the word, it's never going to get in here, the two kingdoms won't work together. You'll have one kingdom going one way, and your head leading you another. I didn't say your heart, I said your head. So you got to build that kingdom within you, so you walk tandemly with the almighty power of God. Can you say amen? <coughs> this is a Christian's right. So we'll cover these four things. Daily present yourself before God, no more than 10 minutes. Two, what happens when we spend 10 minutes to God? What does he do? Three, we are to walk knowing that we are face-to-face -face with God all day long. Unlike Moses, unlike the children of Israel in the Old Testament, God followed them in a cloud and fire and did. They carried him around in a box. Now God's in the atmosphere we breathe in the New Testament. He's everywhere present. Amen. Could you say amen? And all he needs for us to present ourselves and open up to him, and God will flow and keep and watch over you as long as you continue to talk with him throughout the day. In all their ways, the Bible says, acknowledge him. Then he can direct our path. You want your path directed by God? Woo. Let me tell you about some of the times we we're in Haiti. How God shut down all the voodoo temples in that part of the country. Because this boy here decided I wanted to go in and see what a voodoo temple was. Now, I haven't got time to tell this story now, possibly a little later on. But what ended up happening is the Buddha, his two priestesses, had a dream the night before. They saw me coming in and sharing Christ with them. They were all ready to receive Jesus. I walked in with two and two, with uh, Jim Caldwell. I walked in, and he went, huh, oh, like that. Okay, and I know what this is about. Hopefully I won't go too long on this. I walked in, and I said, God sent me. Just like that. Now, P Scott has seen me do that before. If God's sending you, announce him. 
I said, God sent me. And the guy fell down on his knees and the daughters bowed. And they say, we know we had a dream about you last night. And long story short, they gave their heart to the Lord. He showed me what their temple was like. He took me right into their holy place. See, they built their satanic temple just like the, the Jews built their temple. There was an outer court, an inner court, and there was the most holy place and the very most, most holy place. And so he took me through all of these things. In the holy place, there were all these potions for zombies and all. And then when he took me into the most holy place where the priest goes and meets with the devil, there's a stuffed baby in there, a real a stuffed baby. And I says, is that what I think it is? Is yep, that's a stuffed baby that we sacrificed my family for three generations towards the devil. I said, well, I want all this stuff burned, and I want it all tore down. And I want those potions. We're going to take them to the University of Washington, and they're going to study them. And because we brought them to the University of Washington, they now know what's in the puffer and all of that zombie dust that you hear about, you know? They actually do use that on people, on suspecting. So sometimes sit with me, and I'll tell you about some of the journeys in Haiti, Okay. All right. But anyway, they ripped down the voodoo temple and all the temples within 20 miles. They tore them down, burned them, and declared Carfu, which is a province in Haiti, a Christian area. Now, did I know I was doing that? No. Did I know that was going to happen? No. All I simply did is obeyed God. Get it? It's so exciting. You could do it. Man, I wanted to see some of these testimonies come back. You know, I was praying for my, my grandson. I cast the devil out of him. And he's like a new boy. Mm-hmm. Isn't that wonderful? Are you with me? So uh, we're going to cover what happens in 10 minutes. We walk with God and then finally his unshakable kingdom. So point one. Daily present yourself before God. Go with me to Luke chapter 11. You're there. Look at verse 9 through 13. Remember, it's not spending an hour first thing. It's spending just a few minutes presenting yourself and getting him to set you, tune you, and get you ready for the day. Say amen. Reduces at least 60 to 90% of your mistakes. Because you're under his influence and not making decisions for him. Say, oh me. There was that mistake you made the other day. You guessed. You didn't go to God and pray. So, I'm just prophesying kind of to you. So, go to God and pray so less mistakes. Amen. All right. So, he says right in verse 9. So, I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and the it will be open to you. The door will be open to you. For everyone who asks, receive. He who seeks to him, and it will find. And he who knocks to him, it will be what? Did you see a word no? Did you see word God say, I'm not going to bother with you? What he's describing is a time when the kingdom of God would come, New Testament, where when you all you do is ask, and God supplies. If you ask, not from your flesh, but from your heart. Say heart, heart. not flesh. Give me, give me, give me his flesh. Give me, give me, give me, give me. I need, I need, I need, give me, give me, give me. So I can go gamble and play my little give me, give me, give me games. You will be ignored. And you'll say, well, why isn't God listening to me? Because he doesn't like flesh that stinketh. Do not present yourself before the Lord that way. Say, God, I stinketh, please cleanse me. And then, boom, you're, suddenly you appear as a child of God. Say amen. See, are you getting anything out of this? Yeah. All right. These are, these are keys because I want you to be able to share it with other people. Not just, it's not just for you. This is to teach your daughters, your sons, teach friends and people some of these basic, powerful principles that never change. You see, the church got away from these things. Now let's get back. I'm talking generally. Then he goes on, he says, For everyone to ask, receive, he who seeks, finds, he who knocks, it will be open. For if a son, now listen, 
ask for bread from any father among you, will he give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent instead of a fish? Or he asks for an egg, will he give him a scorpion? If you, now listen to this phrase, if you then being what? Now see, I had a hard time with that. I said, Lord, what's up with that? He says, it's before I died and rose again. So nobody truly was righteous on their own. So actually, because we have, everyone say sin. sin. Remember, the worst part of that doesn't just mean you missed it. There's something that's sin in your flesh, okay? And it's there. That's why you age. It's the nature of Satan. See, people, Satan tries to get us to the top. Hey, you forget that sin is my nature. You just think it's your mistakes. You just think it's your mistakes, but don't think it's my nature causing you to make mistakes. I said, you just think it's, you're making mistakes and God has forgiven you, and that's correct, but he doesn't want you to know he's causing you to make those mistakes because of the nature he oozes out of your flesh. That's why we present ourselves to God. You get that knocked back, it's like a weed. You knock it back in the beginning of your day, someone say amen. Knock it back. How did it get in there in the first place? I don't know. But until you figure it out, knock it back. Hello? We had a guy here just recently. A really strange dude. Come I right off the street. Ooh, 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 ooh. Walking down while my wife's teaching Sunday school and says, I just graduated from a Musu school and I'm looking for somebody to practice on. I'm not joking. He walked right down here. I, I, I didn't see it. I'm just hearing it secondhand. Who do you think sent that? That wasn't God. Here, Peggy, let's give you the... And he could show all of his little gooby-doos. Who knows? He could be a chalice releasing boogaloos. Folks, we need to be wise as what? Serpents, gentle as dove. We don't run around paranoid. But when, when I get flags popping off and going, ooh, 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 this is not right. Pay attention. <laughs> it might smell good, might look good, but might not taste very well. All right, moving right along. <laughs> Man, you guys are so wonderful. Happy Father's Day. So a couple of points. So if you being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him. Now, I said, Lord, what is that? And he says, who is the third person of my Godhead in the earth that delivers things to you? The Holy Spirit. So once the Holy Spirit's come, his job will teach you how to ask and receive, how to seek and find, how to knock, and the door will be open to you. But folks, the doorkeeper to the kingdom of God is the Holy Spirit. And when the, we approach the kingdom, and he sees Jesus out in front of our life, because we praise him and love him, the kingdom opens right on up, and God says, go in and take hold of whatever is provided for you. It's like you're going to Costco with an unlimited credit card. And they recognize you when you come in because you have the seal of God on you. Did you know Satan sees that seal? He's scared that you're going to wear it proudly and confidently. A couple of points. The covenant has been established through Christ's death and resurrection. So we now ask, seek, and knock, and through Jesus' name, the kingdom then opens right up to us. So don't be running around going, well, God doesn't answer my prayer. Sometimes he says no. I tell you what, you don't know God. You're talking about someone you don't really know very well. Let's get you to know him very well. Two, look at the way in which God our Father responds to his children. Say amen. Thirdly, notice he called them evil because they were not born again. 
folks, you go to hospitals. Are all those people born again? Or are business partners that know not God? You're going to have a business partner? They want to give you lots of money because you make a good product, Scott being a good one? Well, then he's going to pray over his business partners and the people that want to do business with him, and he's going to cover them with the blood and sick the Holy Ghost on them. That way, he renders what the enemy might want to carry in through that person. Do you ever heard of the, what is it called, the Trojan horse? That's how Satan works. He'll jump on somebody and bring it into a situation hoping to stir up problems. Hello? You got a devil in your neighborhood? Bring Pastor Kerry in. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get rid of them. No, I'm just, you can get rid of the devil. Can you say amen? All right. And fourthly, listen. The Holy Spirit is here in an unlimited way to take care of our needs. The Holy Spirit's job is to keep, get you, keep getting you back to Christ. If you stray a little bit, he keeps pointing you to Christ. The Holy Spirit's job is to keep pointing you to his word, pointing you to Christ. Nobody should be praying to the Holy Spirit. Oh, Holy Spirit, I thank you in Jesus. No, don't ever do that. The Holy Spirit's job is to point you to Christ and keep you with Christ. Now, he's saying, this is Kerry prophesying, would you start helping the Holy Spirit and stop fighting so hard against him? Hello. Would you do me a favor? When you hear me preach, don't interpret what I'm saying. Hear it face value. Can you imagine what it'd be like? Well, Peggy, I hear you saying to me, this is what I'm saying to you. What do you hear me saying to you, Peggy? Look at the corruption in society. Conversations have been warped. People are not listening to the face value of what's being spoken. They're trying to interpret what's being meant. Bad juju. Because when you start interpreting people's what they mean, Satan will take you and lead you. And next thing you know, that person will be doing all kinds of crazy things because Satan told you he was. Folks, discerning of spirits is not suspicion of spirits. Being suspicious is evil. I used to call it paranoid. <laughs> be looking all around you, you know, who's around me and there. No, listen, paranoia, suspicion, looking at people without faith is all Satan's trick. Because the Bible says we're to look at people in love. Love doesn't even notice when people do it wrong. Love doesn't run around and make lists. Well, Peggy, this is the third time you have messed with me. Do you know that Christians think they can get even? I'm talking about little foxes now. Yeah, somebody, you think somebody's doing something to you, so you're going to get even. You know what you're doing? Is you're chasing a rabbit, and you're going to fall right down into the hole, and you're going to find out his name is Satan. Because those are all his games. First of all, it's not love. First of all, it's not clear communication. First of all, it doesn't glorify God. So why are we messing with that stuff? Moving right along. Everyone say, you move right along. All right, point two. What happens in that short 10 minutes we meet with God? Go with me to Romans 12. Look at verse 1. Very familiar scripture, but look how Paul speaks this. He says, I beseech you. The word beseech means I literally beg you. Get this. I beg you. Get this. Get this. Get this. I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you, you present your body. So now we know your body is not you. You is your spirit man. Do you see it? So your spirit man, when you meet with God 10 minutes, say, Lord, I present myself to you, and you see this one hanging around? Talk about my flesh. 
crucify it today. Thank you. I'm on my way to get in the car and put in the car. I like to warm my car up. I don't drive my car cold off because the oil doesn't get spread. So even my little car like that, I'll let it run for five or six minutes while I'm praying and thanking God. I don't go anywhere without asking God to clear the path. Make sure I run into people that I can witness to. Oh, does he do that? Oh, he, he's so excited. Some lady's going out for a smoke break, and she doesn't know why she's extra long at the meat counter, because she's going to meet a man of God who's going to lead her to Jesus. You've got to let God orchestrate your life, and you walk and enjoy it. Don't orchestrate your own life for God. No, let him orchestrate your life and walk into it. Learn the divine flow. And most Christians don't have a clue. I'll teach you the divine flow. That's why that you just flow into the answers. If you prayed about it, then don't get upset about it. If you prayed about it, put it in God's hands, leave it there. All right, point two. What else happened? I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you, your spirit man, present your body a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Better translation is what's expected of you to do good walk. So in the morning when you greet God, Lord, I present my body to cleanse it, press it, and keep it in tune. Now, you can only do that for the day, and some people can't even do that all day long. I know one of our friend's favorite teachers. She says she can't even get up in the morning and be with people unless she's prayed an hour. Well, we're not that way, and, you know, that's kind of religious. I don't agree with it. But you present yourself to God, and God has a way of polishing you up for the day. Remember, you are his child. Once you present yourself to him, listen. He presents you to everything. How did he talk about Job? Have you considered my servant Job? There's none like him in all the world. He was talking to the devil. And he was telling the devil how wonderful his child Job was. How does God talk about you? The same way. How do you talk about yourself? Are you still calling yourself an idiot? A moron? Are you still putting yourself down? Say, no, I me. Mean, come on, smile up at me. Don't put yourself down. Even though you probably deserve to, don't do it. You're a child of God now. Folks, you're a child of God, not a sinner saved by grace. You're a child of God. So you have a different set of an atmosphere that you operate in. Oh, yeah, sin will still destroy you. Oh, yeah, you still could be messing with all that stuff and still have a lousy walk. Many children are disobedient to their parents, and yet those parents are still their parents. We could be disobedient to God and still think we're saved. And I got news for you. It says the wrath of God comes down on the children of disobedience. Ephesians chapter 2. We are not of them, but we are of the Lord. Can you say amen? So everyone get rid of rebellion. All right, so it goes on. So it says, look it, look it, I beseech you, all right? What happens in those 10 minutes? Let's look at it. The purpose, the purpose for us to make a quick face-to-face -face presentation before God is so God can sanctify us and place some under his favor. You mean somebody can get out of sorts through the night? Oh, yes, they can. Somebody sit up all night and be angry at somebody and go home, I mean, go to bed. And if they can sleep, they'll wake up with a headache. This is don't not go to sleep with anger. You see, so enemy has a lot of tricks. Get everything under the blood. Say amen. You want to live in peace. You want to operate in peace. Peace is so much better than turmoil. In order to do that, you walk with the Prince of Peace. You meet with the, the one that gives you the peace. And not like the world gives you. God's peace is beyond description. His love is beyond knowledge. And so good. It's never negative, never bad. All that's religious teaching. You've done it now, Sherry. 
God is mad at you. Have you ever heard that? Listen, you don't need somebody like me to tell you God's mad at you. You will know if he is. God wants to be first in your life, and he wants to tell you first. Now listen, there's a lot of people running around as prophets. Some are. Some are not. They're just helpful people manipulating with the prophetic word. Thus saith the Lord, you better straighten up your act, because if you don't, your family won't come to the Lord. <laughs> I like to ham it up. And they do things like that. Listen, if God ever comes to you through the mouth of somebody, it will, won't be the first time you hear it through that person's mouth. In the New Testament, God lives in your heart. So God will already be telling you it, and somebody will come along because you're doubting and confirm it. But if I tell you to sell your dog and move to Alaska, and God's never said that, you can smile at me and go, I guess Carrie's been eating biscuits. Can you say amen? Folks, there's a lot of shenaggery going on. I had a girl come in here a couple weeks back, and she, she's one of those charismatic maniacs. Now, I believe in charismatic. <laughs> I'm one. But, but this person's taught that she has prayer for her, and then she watches the person praying for her, and she, like a vacuum, is trying to suck up the anointing off of their life. Now, only one or two people know who I'm referring to. Nobody you know. And the last time this wonderful lady came to visit, she said she needed healing. Every time she comes, she needs healing. But what God told me, she was watching how I release healing and all. I don't mind because it's not private. But God says she's trying to suck the anointing that's out of your life onto her life because she doesn't seek God and go after the anointing herself. What are you going to do with something like that? I remember the charismatic. The, how many here remember Women's Aglow? Well, they got pretty squirrely after a while. They were rolling up pillows and smoking Holy Spirits. I mean, I, these are stories I hear people actually went. Now, so this person came, and, and she was trying to get the anointing leap off of me, and God says, don't you do anything but poke her. So she came, and I just poked her owie. Just gently. I said, well, is it her here? Is she hurt there? And see, she's not believing for healing at all. She's waiting for me to release my name and Jesus and get things going. And you see me do that and people get healed. But I don't want to do it in front of somebody who's going to play games with it. And so all I did is touch her and, and I didn't pray. I didn't do anything, did I? No. And of course, I says, there you go. I did exactly what God asked me to do. He said, don't show her anything. I said, there you go, and walked away. Later on, one of our sisters asked her, says, well, did you get healed like all the other times? No. <laughs> Folks, it's not a show. I'm not a performer, okay? We are living in the last days with God, and we need to know how to flow, how to move in power, how to change things. Instead of having circumstances coming and bearing down on us, we just annihilate them and bring the kingdom of God into those areas. Say amen. All right, let's go on. So in 10 minutes, God can cleanse you crucify the flesh, fill you, amplify you, get you tuned up, get you clicked in, and in phase, within 10 minutes of you walking to your car, or you sitting and have a quick cup of coffee before you start your routine. Then start your routine and just talk with God along the way. And next time you're ready to make a decision that's going to cost a thousand or two dollars, make you some money, you seek God. Don't jump flow. I'm going to say it. Don't jump flow. Lord, what do you think? How can I do this? Flow. And it's so much better. No stress. No mess. No going, oh gosh, I should have listened. Are you, do you still love me? Okay, almost done with you. Okay, let's go to our next point. So when I say face-to-face, -face, 
I have two more points. When I say face-to-face, -face, I'm not talking about you spending an hour. I want you to be able to spend a long time with God every day. But you have to find that in your schedule, okay? But don't you start your day out without greeting God and presenting yourself, okay? Every person in the Old Testament, every priest, every prophet, every king, everybody that's been used in any way, shape, or form, the only ones that God used are the ones that pre presented themselves to God in the Old Testament. Now, what makes us think in the New Testament we're any different? Some Christians have gone on their mother's prayers. Listen to me carefully. Some second-generation Christians who had mothers and fathers that are Christian, who prayed for their children, some of the children don't have a prayer life themselves. They don't do anything other than kind of exist on mom and dad's prayers. Well, those are going to run out soon. You better start your own. I know people that had jobs, gotten great things, lots of money on the prayers of their parents. And then when they got out on their own, God says, now I want you to pray, you're going to do this, doing that, and they don't do any of that. And like an airplane, suddenly the engine shut off, and we'll coast for a while, and then we'll drop. Don't you shut your engines off. His name is Jesus. Don't you run on your dad's or your mom's prayers. You run on yours. Say amen. So now you know what happens in a short 10 minutes, you get into face. Much rather get into face. Well, Carrie, you don't have a very stressful life. You don't have any problems, really. Okay, let me embrace what you just said. How do you think I got this way? Thinking of myself and not praying? I have a good life and my wife has an exceptional good life. And the reason why? Our God. Not because I'm any good at anything. <laughs> Just ask my wife. It's the favor of God on us, in us. Not you, Mr. Charming. Not you, lady. You know, it's God on us. So let it God just shine and shimmer on you. When you go see your family, just put a nice smile and peace on your face. Let them see your relationship with God glowing out of you. Then let them ask you the questions. Wow, you look very peaceful today, Sherry. How is that? What's going on in your life? God. Amen. You see, very important, our witness. Okay. All right. We are walking face-to-face -face daily through Christ to God. Say amen. amen. Now, the Bible says that we're to look unto the author and the finisher of our... Faith. Who's that? Jesus. So we're to be looking to Jesus while Jesus is taking us before the Father. So we walk day by day. Let's see if I can say it right with the potential of a face-to-face -face relationship. Now, if you read through the Old Testament and the New Testament, how many times it talks about being face-to-face -face with God, God being face-to-face -face with you? You'll be amazed, and yet you don't hear it preached. God wants you to get up, put your face, his face is right pressed against you, and say, hi, God. He's not going to back off you and say, hey, brush your teeth first. <laughs> Come on, laugh with me. You're face to face. Everywhere you go, you're walking and talking in God. But you're not aware of that. So remember, we have to be aware in all our ways. Acknowledge him or be aware of him, and he will direct your path. So get up. You're face to face with God. Say, Lord, good morning. Bless you this morning. I want to tell you I love you. I appreciate you. Before your head could kick in, let your heart out. Say amen. In doing so, we have developed a face-to-face -face relationship. So let's show you a little bit of the scripture. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3, please, verses 14 through 18, gives us a description of the Old Testament believer. They could not see God. He'd only showed up once in a while. And the ones that only really could meet with God were the high priests or the prophets. 
maybe a king or two if they didn't die. <laughs> king David was one. And so they didn't really have a face-to-face -face relationship. Did you know in the Old Testament, they didn't know that God could come and tabernacle with man, come and dwell inside a man. They were always hoping that God would come down on the planet, wipe out the evil people, and set up his millennial reign. That is going to happen, but he, they missed the church age. The church age is where God appeals to every human being, please come to me, please accept my son, and if you do, I'll give you eternal life. That's why the church is supposed to be preaching Christ, getting people saved, and stop bickering amongst themselves. Gosh, I've called up pastors and I said, hey, let's get together. Don't hear another thing from them. I mean, it's the most amazing, dumbest stuff I've ever seen in my life. Pastor's jealous. Hey, pastor, how's it going? Yeah, it's great. I'd love to see your work here and everything. And then the first thing they ask you is, how big is your congregation? No wonder we don't have revival. We've got a bunch of bozos in there somewhere doing stuff. Now, we need to pray for our leaders. Now, listen, pray for your church leaders. Pray that God put people in there that are really called a pastor, really called to do what they're called to do. Pray for the hospitals. God, bring Christian brothers and sister doctors in there. Pray for your dentists. Pray for the lawyers. Why aren't we asking God to put in place what the devil tried to stick in place? You don't like the man in office? Pray that he's removed and another takes his place. It's scriptural in Isaiah. But don't rail on these people. Remember, railing is a tool Satan uses for us to think that we're justified in criticizing others. I don't know if I can say that again. The act of railing is a sin. Well, I really should rail on that. Look how bad that is. No, you really shouldn't. Because by railing, you open the door for attack. Even if you feel you should rail on it, don't. Because in the last days, mockers will come. Everyone say mocker. That's somebody that's always rebuttaling everything they hear. You know, if you were a better mother, and they're always mocking, and they're always putting down. I used to be one of those mockers, didn't know what I was doing. I hear something on the radio, some goofy commercial, then I'd mock it. And God says, Carrie, what are you doing? I says, I guess I'm mocking. He says, I don't want you mocking at all. Because once you get in the habit of doing that, you'll find yourself doing it often. And you'll open the door and the enemy will flag you. So everyone say, keep mocking away from me. So don't laugh at anybody. Laugh with them. Don't mock anything or anyone, even though it deserves to be mocked. Because it opens you up. So when I get a chance to teach you some of these little backdoor items, once you slam them, your life is going to be really taking on some great peace. So watch your habits a little bit. Say amen. You're walking face to face to God. One thing I used to do when I was praying to God a lot is I'd bring up what the devil was doing. He's doing this and he was doing that. Finally, I realized God said again to me, he says, son, don't you know that I see all of that? I don't need you to tell me what the enemy's doing. I need you to invite me in to destroy his works. So we just say, oh, Lord, the devil's done that, and he's doing that, and he's ranking on this and ranking on. God says, stop it. Now, would you pray me in their areas? Bring me in by invitation. Intercede. You know what intercession is? Listen, I hope you get this. It's when you intercede, you bring in God's people before God, right? And you bring in God before his people. It's the most magnificent display of love that could ever be displayed is intercessory prayer. Bringing people before God and bringing God into them. Say amen. Instead of railing on them, pray for them. And it goes on. I like what, when you know, Jesus says, come unto me all that you are heavy laden, and I will give you what? Rest? All right, so we are walking face to face. Second Corinthians chapter 3, verse 14. But their minds were blinded. 
This is the Old Testament. For until this day, the same veil remains unlifted in the reading of the Old Testament because the veil is taken away in Christ. But even today, this day, when Moses, the Old Testament is being read, there's a veil, veil that lays on their heart. Nevertheless, now look at this next phrase, when one turns to the Lord, that veil is taken away face to face. There's no sin between us and God now. You might think there is, but God is looking at you face to face. Talk with him. Share with him. Open your heart to him. Say amen. In the Old Testament, you couldn't know God face to face. In the New Testament, Jesus brings us face to face with the Father. Say amen. Then it goes on. Nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord, now where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Spirit of God is in your heart. It's in the atmosphere you breathe. But we all, with an unveiled face, as beholding in a glass the glory of the Lord, what are we being changed to? To the same image of Christ from glory to glory. So what are you focusing on? Everything you put your eyes on will have some effect. Jesus says, if your eyes be single, your body be filled with light. If your eyes be out of focus, your body be filled with darkness because you're double-minded. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Don't even let that person think he can receive anything from the Lord. That's what it is when you switch from your understanding to your heart, from your heart to your understanding, there's two minds there. You have Christ's mind and you have your own understanding. And they go vip, 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 vip. That's why the other night when I said, I says, we worship before we receive the, worship, the word. Because the worship tenderizes our heart so the seed falls on good ground. Can you say amen? Otherwise, if we don't worship, our head will, our head will, how do you say it? Our head will head off to the past what belongs in our heart. And it will capturate it and analyze it, and very little will get into your heart. So you don't analyze the word with your head. You receive it like a child with your heart. Then God brings it up into the eyes of your understanding. And then he begins to show you what it's really like. Someone say, oh me. That's good stuff, folks. That's how God does. You get it in your spirit first and it goes into your head. Do not engage your head only. All right, so everyone say face to face. Now, my last point. My last point is this. You're receiving an unshakable kingdom, right? Okay, receiving an unshakable kingdom. Go with me to Hebrews chapter 12. I'm finishing with you. Now, in the Old Testament, the Israelites had to come to a place called Mount Sinai. Everyone say Mount Sinai. Remember the Ten Commandments and Moses? Huh? Come on. Mount Sinai, where he went up and met with God, right? Okay. But see, in the New Testament, mountains were places where God hid away from the people so that only the people of Sodom could find him. So now God's on Mount Zion. So in the New Testament, we didn't count, come to Mount Sinai because there was thundering and there was bolts of lightnings and people died because they touched holy places. But in the New Testament, we come to a place called Mount Zion. Everyone say Zion. Z-I-O-N. It means the habitation of God himself. Hello. So in the New Testament, God translated us out of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son, and we now dwell with God in Mount Zion. And you say, well, that's really hard. See, if you were Jewish, you would understand this. And this is in the Jewish scripture. Remember, it was relating to the Jewish mind. So to Jews, God dwells in mountains and in boxes and temples. And so God met with us. But he meets with us in the spirit. So look what he says. Verse 25. See that you do not refuse him who speaks. For if they did not escape who refused him who spoke on earth. 
That's talking about Moses. Much more shall we not escape if we turn away from him who speaks from heaven. Who's that? God. How many know that when God speaks, it's not for foolishness? Better pay attention. Okay. He was, uh, verse 26, whose voice then shook the earth, and now he has promised, saying, yet once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heaven. Take a look around you. What's shaking now? Earth, the heavens, earthquakes, all kinds of crazy things, right? And folks, for a while there, I got the hiccup, sorry. For a while there, the church have got their eyes on everything in the world. My goodness. Where were the Christians at when we had all this fighting and stuff over the, the Trump and the whole thing? They took their eyes off of God and got involved in that. Oh, but you know, it's just it's our country and everything like that. Yeah, you want the devil out? Stop watching what he's doing and start kicking him out. You have authority to kick the devil out of your nation. Hello? You have the authority to bow your knee and say, Lord, I repent over all the abortions that was done in this nation. And because I'm a citizen of this nation, and even though I didn't do that, I repent for the nation, Father. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and seek his face and turn from their wicked ways, not only will I hear from heaven, but I will heal their land and restore them. That's you and I. Are you understanding something? So you and I have received the kingdom at Pentecost, but we can only get our hands on it through the word and Christ that's being built in our, hand, our heart. For we are his creatures brought forth by the word of God, it says in James chapter 1, verse 21. So we need the word in us so that the kingdom is built up in us and the kingdom is surrounding us and Satan is losing everything all the control of our life. And as we build the kingdom through the word in our heart and our love and our praise with God, the kingdom is responding to the king in our heart. Can you say amen? And we learn to walk with him, letting him lead the way. For we follow the shepherd. Amen. And here's what's wrong with the church. They're not following any shepherd. They're doing their own thing. And the devil's leaving them alone. Why should he de deceive them? They're already deceived. Take a look at that mouse up the street. Totally, every one of them lost. And yet they're good people. In times, baby. See, in times. Watch what it says. He says, not only whose voice shook the earth then, but it shook it, will shake it not only the earth, but the heavens. Verse 27, but now this, yet once more indicates the removal of those things which are being shaken. What is God going to do here soon? He's going to receive the church home, isn't he? It's called the rapture. We gave you some clips of it to see what it's like. But also... He was going to get rid of the wicked. He's going to burn them with unquenchable fire and like chaff. How do you know the difference between a wicked person and a good person? You can't tell. <laughs> Only God is the judge. Are you with me? So the things that are being shaken are being removed. Is our country being shaken? You better believe it is. And what needs to be removed? The wickedness. Pray, Father, remove all wickedness. Your face is against those that do evil. Replace, pluck up, and remove those that are in your way. This country has been dedicated to God. You just stick with that prayer and pray it every morning and thank God for it. Stop trying to be creative a lot in your prayers, especially when it comes to something as vast as a nation. Ask God to guide you in them. Amen. Then finally, therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom, verse 28, that cannot be shaken, keep getting in the word, folks, let us have grace. Grace, grace, we need more grace. Let us have grace. I love it. Let us have a grace by which we serve 
God acceptably with reverence and godly fear for God our God is a consuming what now most people don't understand this what did Moses see on the mountain a burning bush but the bush was not uh, burning up what was God showing him he was showing the beginning of all creation everything God created was good it was on fire because God is a consuming fire Amen. And Moses caught, love, he saw all the branches, all the bushes, high branches. You can either be a dead branch or on fire branch. And if you're all like us, we're on fire, aren't we? Say yes. yes. So we're full of God's love and good God. And, and Peggy asked me a while ago, she says, what's the fire for? Have you got some chaff in your life? Are there some things you don't quite proud of? Don't tell me what they are. I don't want to know. We all do. The fire of God in your heart is burning away the worthlessness that we once had as our life. He's burning up your anger, and he's burning up your lack of patience. He's burning up all of the irritableness that sometimes, remember, we used to fly off the handle. He's burning that up inside of you. And next thing you know, you're going to become just like a son. If you keep on being consistent. Did you get anything out of it this morning? Will you give the Lord a praise? So meet with God.